Hello there, welcome to another GCSE History Revision tutorial. We're going to look at the period of 1700 to 1900 in overview in this video. So our key point is that this was a period of rapid change in medicine and there are a number of factors that contribute to this. Firstly attitudes, with the key change being the end of laissez-faire which weakened from the mid 19th century onwards. And that really fed into an enhanced role for government. Crucially, the 1875 Public Health Act, which was compulsory and focused on sanitation. And furthermore, the work of key individuals such as Florence Nightingale, James Simpson and Joseph Lister, who we'll have a look at in more detail in this video. As well as the importance of work overseas, such as Louis Pasteur in France and Robert Koch in Germany. And lastly, the enhanced role of technology. This was the industrial age, and it led to increased um, developments in things such as microscopes and laboratory equipment. So we've got four key factors that play a role. It's really worth your time knowing at least three of those in detail. Let's look at developments in ideas about the cause of disease in this period. So for the most part, miasma theory dominated thinking across this time. And this was an explanation based on reason and observation. Industrial towns were particularly grim places. And in the Great Stink in 1858, the River Thames um, was completely clogged with sewage. And the foul smells of industrial Britain led to a common sense approach and it was poisonous air and the fumes within it that caused disease. Now the impact of miasma theory was that it limited the effectiveness of public health measures until late on in the period. And key reasons for the weakening of miasma theory towards the end of the period was work of John Snow in which he proved that cholera was not a, um, a disease spread by miasma that it had to be waterborne. And secondly, the importance of Louis Pasteur's germ theory, which proved the importance of germs rather than poisonous fumes in air. Let's look at germ theory in a little more detail. So the key idea is that disease is caused by microbes. Louis Pasteur is our key individual here. So this proved that previous ideas of spontaneous generation were false. Now the impact of germ theory is really, really important. It means that public health measures started to be effective with an increased focus on sanitation. And secondly, with um, ideas around the cause of disease, it led to effective prevention. Louis Pasteur managed to explain how vaccination worked and that led to further developments through into the 20th century. So Pasteur's personal importance here is really key. He proved that his theory worked. He found a way to explain vaccinations. And thirdly, he created his own vaccinations, for example, with rabies. But in this work, he was assisted with, by Robert Koch. Now Koch and Pasteur were rivals. One was French, one was German, and they were very critical of each other's work. But Pasteur used a lot of Robert Koch's laboratory techniques in his own work. And Robert Koch succeeded in some areas where Pasteur had failed. So for example, it was Robert Koch who identified the first microbe for a human disease when he identified tuberculosis. And his laboratory techniques managed to um, speed up further discoveries. So he worked by staining bacteria and finding better mediums for them to growing, such as jelly. Let's look at some key individuals and their approaches to treatment. And firstly, let's consider Florence Nightingale's work with hospitals. So before Florence Nightingale's work, hospitals were increasing in number across Britain, but they were unsanitary, often very low quality, and nursing had a poor reputation. But Florence Nightingale was a celebrity nurse thanks to her work in the Crimea. 
in which she came to national importance. And when she returned to Britain, she carried on her work. The government used her as an advisor, and she wrote manuals on training of nurses. And so the impact that she had went right the way through to the end of the period. The status and the quality of nursing rose, and also the quality of sanitation in hospitals improved too. Secondly, let's consider James Simpson's work with anaesthetics. So this focuses on surgery, and before Simpson's discovery, surgery was quick and it was brutal because patients were conscious, writhing around in pain and liable to die of shock. So surgeons worked as quickly as they could, and the most famous one was Robert Liston. There were no effective anaesthetics before Simpson's work. Some were available, such as ether and laughing gas, but these had drawbacks, such as side effects, being explosive, and being um, variable in the quality of doses that patients were given. So James Simpson discovered chloroform in 1847, and this was the first effective general anaesthetic. He faced some early opposition to his work, but it was rapidly adopted after Queen Victoria used it in childbirth in 1853. So the impact of chloroform is revolutionary. Do remember though that Simpson did face some opposition. Some in the church were against it on grounds of morality and some surgeons opposed it because it took away the need for them to work quickly and changed the whole nature of surgery. It led to more complex and slower operations. So actually, after anaesthetics were discovered, death rates actually rose because surgeons managed to slow down and do more complex surgery. And we call this the black hole period of surgery. Okay, let's have a look next at the work of Joseph Lister with antiseptics. So before Lister's work, there were very high mortality rates in operations. Post-operation infection was a big problem. This is where germs had got into the open wounds um, that were created during surgery. Now Lister is really affected by, um, by Louis Pasteur. He'd read germ theory and he applied Pasteur's work to practical ideas in surgery. Uh, Lister was aware that carbolic acid was used in sewage plants to dampen down the smells and so he applied this to surgery for the first time in 1865 and he just simply introduced a carbolic acid spray into operating theatres. Now the impact of his work was pretty immediate. Death rates fell dramatically. For example, uh, amputations, operations of legs, death rates fell from just under half to one in eight. He did face some opposition by surgeons though, mostly because his um, work was so incredible they found it hard to believe that it was possible to achieve the results that he had done. He also carried on playing around with his ideas and carried on trying to refine and improve things and that led some to criticise him for being unsure about what he wanted. Now Lister's work is really the start of a process of fighting microbes in surgery. It leads to further developments again to the end of the period and beyond where aseptic surgery, when no germs are present at all in the operating theatre, became possible. Next, let's have a look at approaches to prevention. There are two key public health acts for us to know about in this period. The first one, in 1848, was a voluntary act. That meant that authorities didn't have to take up the measures that were in it. And this meant it was ineffective. And secondly, an 1875 act, this time it was compulsory. So towns authorities had to act on the measures that were included in it. It was compulsory and therefore this was the effective one. So let's consider why attitudes have been so slow to change before 1875. And our key idea here is laissez-faire. Now this is the idea that the government had no place interfering 
in social welfare and in people's lives. They should leave alone. And this attitude, coupled with the vested interests of those who had to pay for any potential improvements, meant that change was very slow. And thirdly, miasma theory, which was the dominant idea before germ theory, meant that any actions that were taken were often misdirected. So for example, Edwin Chadwick's report of 1842 was misdirected and ignored. So as you said, the 1875 Act forced towns to act and it focused on sanitation. So improved water supplies were key here, so as putting in improved drainage. Now these are very expensive things and took a lot of time to do. But these material improvements were also coupled with um, human resources. So towns had to introduce medical officers of health, food inspectors, sanitary inspectors, and these kind of things. And the 1875 Act was just the start. There were some other acts which would be nice if you knew about, such as the Sale of Food and Drugs Act, which improved food supplies, the Artisans Dwellings Act, which focused on working class housing and slum clearance, the River Pollutions Act, which tried to clear up the environment. And we can call this whole collection of acts from 1875 up towards the end of the century as the Great Cleanup. OK, I have a couple of case studies to consider. These are key individuals that are mentioned by name in our syllabus. So firstly, let's have a look at Edward Jenner's work with vaccination. So before Jenner, there was no effective or safe prevention available against disease. The disease that Jenner focused on was smallpox. There was a fairly unreliable technique used before Jenner's work of inoculation where some weakened smallpox matter would be either um, placed into a cut or blown up the nose of a patient and that this would hopefully give um, immunity to smallpox but it was unreliable it was dangerous and it often led to the patient infecting other people um, at the time that they were infectious with the smallpox so edward jenner applied rural knowledge he was working in Gloucestershire and it was local knowledge that milkmaids didn't tend to get smallpox, particularly if they'd had the milder disease of cowpox. So Jenner made a change to practice. So instead of putting smallpox matter into people, he placed cowpox matter into them. He did this first on a young boy called James Phipps and he wrote up his findings and then repeated the experiment over 20 times, proving that vaccination worked. And he published his findings. Now the government supported Jenner's work. They set up clinics, which they funded in major towns and cities. And over time, smallpox was eradicated. This was coupled with compulsory vaccination programs. But Jenner did face opposition. Remember, he was operating in a period where laissez-faire was a prevailing idea. So a lot of people didn't see it as a government's role to, um, to interfere in their lives. And secondly, some of his work was rejected by the Royal Society, who didn't um, place faith in the work of a countryside doctor, as opposed to one from London. Lastly, let's have a look at John Snow's work with cholera. Again, he's a key individual and a case study in our syllabus. Now, before John Snow's work, there are regular cholera epidemics in London and in other major English cities as well. These have been prevalent since the 1830s. And cholera was blamed on miasma. And water supplies in these towns and cities were filthy and dirty and unknown to the people, it was this that was killing people and spreading the cholera. So John Snow, in an epidemic in the early 1850s, decided to research what was going on. And he focused in his local area, in Soho, in the centre of London. And as a piece of research, he interviewed residents and drew up a, uh, an infection map. 
and he noticed that it centred on the Broad Street water pump. And so his action was very simple. He simply removed the handle and then within a matter of days, collar had pretty much disappeared in the local area. And on further inspection, they found that the um, water pump was being infected by a leaking cesspit, which was um, just metres away. So in this work, John Snow had proved that cholera was a waterborne disease. It wasn't miasma. And thanks to Snow, cholera epidemics soon ended. But it wasn't an immediate take-up of his ideas. Water supplies were slow to improve, again because it was a very costly business, and there was vested interests um, that, um, that stood against these improvements happening. And it really took decades for people to accept Snow's work. Remember, he couldn't quite explain how things were, were happening. He could just explain what was happening. And it took germ theory to, um, to allow that understanding to take. Okay, so we've covered quite a lot of material there. You might just want to review the video at this point. Maybe have a look at this explain question. Explain why there was rapid change in ideas about the prevention of illness during the period circa 1700 to 1900. And I've put together a quick paragraph here. It tries to sustain the explanation in the second half of the paragraph. So what you might like to do as a quick exercise is to write your own paragraph on another factor, maybe using one of the ones that we identified at the very start of the video. And you might like to go yet further. Maybe have a quick go at this knowledge checker. Have a look at these questions. Maybe pause the video at this point and I'll put the answers up next. Okay, here are the answers. Have a little look how you did. Okay, we've made it to the end. We covered a lot of material there, so you might like to go back a little bit more carefully and with a bit more time to look through this. Thanks for watching. There's lots of other guidance on the CHSG History channel. Good luck with your revision. More videos will be coming up soon.